they want to be challenged. They want to be pushed into something that is not normal. Welcome to Whistlekick, Martial Arts Radio, episode 288. And today, I'm joined by Master Tim Smith. It's a great episode. I love this one. Hopefully, you're going to love it, too. And guess what? We have 287 other episodes that you can check out all for free here on Martial Arts Radio. They're available on YouTube. They're available on your favorite podcast app. They're available at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And in fact, when I say there are 287 other episodes, that's a bit of a lie. There are actually 288 other episodes because if you sign up for our newsletter, we send you our exclusive behind the scenes top 10 tips for martial artists episode. It's never been released publicly on the podcast feed, and it never will. We only send it to those folks who are willing to get our once or twice monthly newsletter. We don't spam you. We don't sell it. Your address, that is. We don't sell the newsletter either. In fact, we give you discounts sometimes to products we sell. The products that we sell on whistlekick.com, the products that are available all over the place. Amazon, maybe your martial arts school has a pro shop and maybe our stuff is there. We are all over the place. And the number of places that we are continues to grow. It is mind boggling. But I haven't even told you who I am. My name is Jeremy Lesnick. I'm the founder here at Whistlekick. And I am the blessed guy who gets to talk about martial arts as part of his job. And that's what I'm doing here today. This episode touches me in a bit of a different way than most of our episodes because our guest today grew up shy, had some noticeable speech issues as a child, and he was bullied because of his differences. Those experiences, while not the same as my own story, are similar enough that it gives us some common ground. Experiences we do spend some time discussing. Master Tim Smith has been training since he was 11, and he hasn't stopped since. His is a great story, so let's listen to it. Oh, how are you doing, Jeremy? I'm doing great. How about yourself? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you. Sorry about last week on that. Hey, not a problem. You know, coordinating this stuff is not easy, and I'm still, you know, we are over three years in now, and I'm still learning tips and tricks to to make it easier for everybody. I mean, thank heaven we don't have to deal with time zone math. <laughs> exactly. exactly. And I have my wife doing all my business stuff for me, so I think we had a little confusion on phone numbers. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, hey. So I know, apologize on that. Hey, don't worry about it. it, it <laughs> you know, good things come to those that wait, right? They say Absolutely. that. So, so Absolutely. we're, you know, we just kicked it back a week, and now here we are, and and we get to talk. Absolutely. Yeah. Everything coming through fine on your end? Yes. It's, it's, are you doing good over there? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You sound, yeah. You sound wonderful. Yeah. No, good. Good. Cool. That's the first time I ever heard that. My wife tells me to shut up all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not stepping in that one. <laughs> I, well, I, we've been married for 20, well, gosh, 26 years, so she has the right to every now and then. So, <laughs> Does she train with you? No, she doesn't. She's, well, she tried before. She got up to, I want to say, Orange Belt, but she couldn't separate the business side from the martial arts side. Because she's my business manager. Oh, okay. Interesting. So she's just had a hard time kind of turning her mind off of there. You know what I mean? And then yeah. when she's on the mat, she's always wondering what was happening on the other side of the mat. So she just couldn't. And this just wasn't for her. I mean, that's, that's okay, you know. But yet at the same time, she's still involved in martial arts. Oh, absolutely. You know, we... Absolutely. She she does. She makes sure the studio runs fine. Um she got. She has my back in a lot of different ways. So she is involved in martial arts. She goes to seminars with me and kind of hangs oh, out there awesome. and watches. And so yeah, absolutely, she is. I'm sure that. I guess we can call it division of labor. Absolutely. Um, there you, you know, go. That's I, the best. Absolutely. I never thought about that. Absolutely. She's hmm. behind the scenes person. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think we can all think of of those people that we lean on in in business and. Yeah, Having a well, martial arts business is no different, so you're... Yeah, well, she allows me to concentrate on teaching part and yeah. kind of growing that part of it where she can handle, you know, we both know our strength, strengths and weaknesses, and that is her strength, and she allows me to do what I do best on there, which is it's a good partnership. There's some amazing parallels to training in what you're saying. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> cool. Absolutely. 
Well, you know, if if you're okay with it, because th- this is, you know, the audio quality has been fine since you picked up the phone, and and we kind of have this good chat going. I don't I don't want to break the flow. Can we just kind of keep rolling and and call this all part of the episode? Oh, absolutely. I have okay. no problem with that. Yeah, all right. Absolutely. Well, then let me let me take a moment to take a step back and and introduce you to the listeners. I'll record an intro later, but you know I do appreciate that formality. It's something I like doing. So, listeners, mm-hmm. today we have Master Tim Smith on the line here, and you know we're just. We're we're just going to see where it takes us. You know, Absolutely. as you already heard, we just kind of started wandering off and talking about martial arts business and and who knows where else we're going today. But let's let's take a step back. I mean, this is this is a question I often ask early on because I think it helps set the tone. How did you get started in the martial arts? Um, it kind of was, I never really was looking for martial arts. Um, when I was a kid, I had a speech problem growing up. And um, I got picked on it a lot for it. I got not only verbally abused, but physically abused for my speech problem. And I was kind of shy and um, wouldn't really talk to people. So I didn't really have a lot of confidence, if that makes sense. Yeah. And, you know, that went up till, boy, I think I was in fifth grade, something like that. So I kind of had that issue going on. And I remember one time I, when I was living in California, my mom took me to a movie. And it's like one of them outdoor drive-in theaters that had about five different screens going on. And my mom took me to go see Herbie the Love Bug. And I remember that. And I didn't really like Herbie the Love Bug. <laughs> so I was watching around on different movies. And I seen this guy in this other screen. He was a real short guy. He's wearing a yellow jumpsuit. And he was kicking somebody in the face. And he had so much energy on him. And it looked like he had so much confidence. And that turned out to be Bruce Lee on Enter the Dragon. And um, I, I was so enthralled with him, the way he was looking, the way his confidence was, that I asked my mom, you know, can I, you know, start whatever he's doing? And I kind of looked around and found out that that was karate or martial arts. And I made the phone call about two days later to the nearest karate school I could find. And I started right from there. I think I was about 11 years old mm-hmm. on there with it. And I've been with it ever since. <laughs> wow. What has changed for you and your training and and let's let's talk about the the part of martial arts that's that's internal in your mind what has changed for you as you approach martial arts from the moment you saw the guy in the yellow jumpsuit jumping around to now um You know, I I realized that, you know, the power, you you don't let other people have power, and that's come through martial arts and the training that, you know, I was letting other people have power over me doing that. When I started martial arts and I started doing karate, I realized that the power that I had was in me and not anybody else. And once I learned that through the training and discipline and and just learning how to defend myself, basically, that I, I realized, hey, that's what that guy in the yellow jumpsuit had, is that he had the power within him to not, I don't know how to put, really care what other people think. And I think that's what I was taking out of training. It's more of the physical side, but the mental side, it was more, you know, I don't, I don't really care what other people think thinks about me anymore because I know my power, what I have within me, that makes sense to you. Mm, yeah. And um no so I think that's what changed from there from then to now is that I have more control over what I do, my power within me, um and that's pretty much it right there. It's such a part of so many people's journeys and not just in martial arts. I, I think we we sometimes those of us that have been bullied i think it's easy for us to think that it's it's something that only happens to some people and that Mm -hmm. it it, in that way it can sometimes become a um a badge Mm -hmm. absolutely you know we Um, identify with it but yeah i consider the badge of honor honestly um you know um the gentleman that was bullying back when I was a kid, um, he actually called me. He got through Facebook with me a while back ago, and he called me, and he apologized for it. And we had a really good conversation. And that was way back. That was 40 years ago, you know. And he called me, and and 
apologized for it. And I can, I told him that's kind of what I consider. I said it was a badge of honor. He changed my life. I mean, he took that, and I went from a negative to a positive. That was that because of what he was doing. I could have gone different ways, and what he did changed my life on there. So I, th- I consider it was a badge of honor because. You know, it basically became who I am today. With it. Yeah. No, I'm sure you do. How do you bring that forward into the way that you teach? What are you considering as you work with, I'm espe- expecting especially younger children who you probably have a good idea or are getting picked on at school? You know, how does, how does your experience make you a better instructor for them? Okay. Um, over the last couple of years, I couldn't. Um, when the first time he, one of my students came in and talked about bullying, I mean, I tried to answer the best I could, but I didn't think I had the answers he wanted. So over the last 20 years, I kind of figured out just to listen and understand what they're coming from. And listening is the major thing that I found that I could refine is listening and not, you know, say I have all the answers. So sometimes they just need to be heard about it. And then once they, they're heard, they feel better and a bit more empowered that somebody is listening to them. So I think that's what I got out of that. And so over the last couple of years, I've been just really trying to, um, we've been putting a, together a bully program on how to you know, handle bullies, how to understand bullies, um, how to talk to them. And then I just made sure that they know my door's open and I may not have the answers for them, but I will definitely listen to them with it. Yeah. As someone who's, who was bullied, I mean, you know, we have that in common and I'm, I know so many of the listeners have reached out over the years to say that they've had similar experiences, just validating that it's mm-hmm. happening. Absolutely. When everyone around them, you know, especially their peers and, You know, we're slowly seeing a shift in culture, but oftentimes it's still looked at as kids being kids or things like that. And you know what? Maybe that's true. But if that's true, it's true in hindsight. It's not Mm -hmm. true in the moment when you're eight years old and you're being stuck in a trash can. Absolutely. You know what I found, too, you know, with the culture wise, you know, and like you said, there's a small shift going on. But, you know, especially with boys, boys are like, you know, I heard dad saying, well, that's just part of growing up. You know, you learn, you learn and you handle it. And, you know, that to a point that is true. But, you know, I feel that a lot of the kids, when the parents were telling them that, you know, that's just part of growing up, that's a rite of passage that they're not being validated or what's happening. You know, when you're eight years old and like you said, being your head put into a trash can, they need somebody to validate that. And they need, you know, they need to have somebody listen to them with it. Mm. Yeah. If you could go back and you could be the martial arts instructor now Mm -hmm. to you as a child, what would you tell yourself? Um, don't be afraid. Um, have courage to speak out. Um, hold your head high. Um, and honestly, don't back down. You know, um, that's kind of what I would tell them, that you hold your head high, don't be afraid, and have courage to stand up to them on there with it. Because that's, once I'd done that, after I learned martial arts, and kind of once I'd done that um, for the first time, it kind of took care of the problem <laughs> with it. I'm sure in your time teaching and training and all that, you've got some pretty great stories. We we like talking about stories here. They're my favorite parts of the episode. Mm-hmm. Do you have a great story you'd be willing to share with yeah. us? Maybe your favorite? I do. And, you know, it's not an exciting story, but to me it's kind of exciting. Um, when I was kind of growing up, and I think the movie came out in 1991, I seen The Perfect Weapon with Jess Speakman. And... Um, it's kind of like one of my favorite movies at that time because it kind of showed Kemple what Kemple was about. And I kind of really enjoyed it because it's the first one I've seen where Kemple actually, you know, works, right? Mm. So I always kind of like Jeff Speakman. So I was going to go to Vegas a while back ago for um, for a seminar there. We had the Gathering of the Eagles in Vegas one time, and I heard that Mr. Speakman was there, and I called him. I said, hey, can I come see your studio or your dojo? I mean, I heard it was beautiful. And his assistant said, sure, come on in, right? So I went in there and kind of looked around his dojo, and his assistant was showing me around. And, and all of a sudden, I heard, how are you doing? I turned around, and Mr. Speakman was there. 
I went, oh, you know, it's like a little kid meeting an idol, you know what I mean? And so I got to talk to him for a little bit. He was there, and he was very gracious, and he kind of talked to me and showed me around, and I had a couple of my students with me, and we he was very gracious, and I thought that would be an end of it. So the next day at the hotel, um, Mr. Speakman was going to be one of the presenters for that gathering of the Eagles, and I was down in the coffee line getting coffee, and I had a tap on my shoulder, and turned around, it was Mr. Speakman. And he said, you know, we didn't get a lot of time to talk. So, you know, you want to sit down and have coffee and talk with me? And, of course, I said yes. So we sat down and we talked for about a good hour before the seminar. So that was kind of exciting for me because it was somebody I always grew up with in martial arts with. And I got to finally meet him, and he actually took time out to sit down and talk to me. And, you know, I've been communicating with him and on and off for the last couple of years because of that. So it's been kind of, that was kind of a cool story for me with it. Wow. Yeah, he's he's such a good guy. And and you're not the first person to, to tell me a, a story similar to this. I don't know that we've had others on the show, but he's always struck me as someone who didn't let fame get in the way. You know, he, no, he, I do not believe he did. Um, he was down to earth. He was just very humble. Um, and just he was just a great person to talk to at the time. Absolutely. Cool. I'd like you to think about life and how life has changed, how life has grown. And I'd like you to think about one of the rough times. Tell us about um, some time when things weren't going well and how your martial arts saved you. Um, there's, you know, when I when I was growing up, I had, like I mentioned, a speech issue. I was very shy, and I wouldn't talk to people. And um, so that was kind of the beginning of things for me. And through the years, I had some up and downs for... Um, because of that, I had some issue with things. Um, you know, one of the lowest parts of my life is um, we, you know, it's, I was getting, I don't know how to put this, I was getting kind of picked up in an adult life. I was kind of getting picked on. Um, and I felt really unconfident. All of a sudden, my, my little boy came back to me. And I was being that 11-year-old boy again who was getting picked on. And and that happened for a little while. I was at work and it was happening for a little while. And I mean, it doesn't seem like much now, but it was back then. You know, this was you know twenty twenty five years ago. You know, it was hard for me. And my wife was trying to figure it out. And and I do martial arts. I kind of figured I had to kind of dive back into that and say, hey, you know, I, I'm I'm a black belt now. I'm not that little boy again who was getting picked on. And you know, I know different now, and once I realized that, it kind of helped me to get my confidence back in and kind of get me going again and kind of get me moving again. And I stood up and said, enough is enough, and I handled the problem, and it finally went away. And it's because of my martial arts training where I can kind of dig back in and say, hey, I'm not the same boy back then. I'm different now. And it helped me kind of get everything back in the line with it. I'd love for you to expand on that a little bit because I'm sure we have some folks out there who aren't able to lean on that standing as black belt. You know, I, I, I do that myself. We, we talk about that on the show, the idea that when you look at the work that's gone in, whether that's overall or specifically the test to earn your black belt, for many of us, it's something that we can hold up in our mind and say, I achieved this. I am a different person. I can get through anything, you know, whatever it is. But maybe we have a white belt or a blue belt out there who's listening, and they're not able to do that. Do you have advice for them? Well, I think I think everybody has that energy in them, that confidence in them. I really, truly believe that. I, I think they, deep down, they have a, a mechanism that they can kick on that is, that will help them with their confidence and they just need to step back and take a deep breath instead of worrying about the, the, the day and the time that they're being picked on. Take a step back and say, okay, this is who I am. And 
this is what I've done and this is why I'm an important person and and just really start thinking about the positives of yourself and what you have done positive for yourself. And to me, that will help start building your confidence, uh, confidence up. And then once you do it, I, I think that will unleash a, a lot of power within you that will allow you to do almost anything you want to do, including setting up with, with bullies on there. And you don't have to be a black belt. You could be a white belt. You could be a non-martial artist um, and still find that power. You just need to step back and realize that you have it in you and that you have done great things in your life. And you can find that power if you dig deep enough on there and listen to it and use that power for it. With it. Mm. Good words. If you can't tell, and, and listeners, if you can't tell, you know, we're, we're talking about a subject that I only recently on an episode realized I had a lot more work to do to deal with, you know, the, the bullying stuff from my childhood. So the questions I'm asking you are selfish. They're completely selfish. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you know, Absolutely. Just getting some perspective okay here. <laughs> well, well, good. I hope so. Because right now it's just, it's you and I and, and the listeners uh, get, get to listen. You know, they get, mm-hmm. um, I'll give them, I'll give everyone a re- full refund if they don't like this episode. <laughs> <laughs> all, all zero dollars and zero cents that people Absolutely. have to pay to listen. Let's switch it up a little bit. Okay. Who's been the most influential person on your martial arts? So oh, well, wow. um, well, you know, of course, my instructor, Mr. Schrover, um, he's his name is um, Steve Schrover, and he's been a mighty big influence on me. Um, just, um, I've had him as instructor over the last twenty something years, and I can't say enough great things about him. But besides him, um, Mr. Ted Sumner, who is a tenth degree black belt in in uh, Chase's Kempo. Um, he's been a big influence on me too. Not only has me had me look at different ways of doing Kempo and kind of different way of looking at Kempo. You know, he introduced me into the healing art parts of Kempo about the um the healing side of, of martial arts. So that was kind of a fun way to kind of look at my training. That kind of took it to a new different level. So I think Mr. Sumner is probably one of the biggest influences too with me. And I'll kinda of ask that question in a different a hypothetical way. Mm-hmm. Who would you want to train with? Oh, easily. Um, dead or alive? Yeah. Yeah, uh, Bruce Lee, easily, okay. hands down. Um, I mean, if it wasn't for his movie, um, I wouldn't be where I am nowadays. So I just like to train with him, and I liked his approach about being, you know, using different styles, and I like his uh, philosophy in martial arts. I, I think Bruce Lee, hands down, would be the one I want to train with. Absolutely. I enjoy watching all of his movies, and I like the way he moves, and I just like to dig into his brain a little bit deeper and really kind of talk the philosophy side of martial arts, not necessarily the, the physical side of it, but the philosophy part of it, because I'd I love to tap that mind mm. <laughs> with it. You kind of glossed over it, but I want to I dig in. You said that if it wasn't for Bruce Lee, you wouldn't have found martial arts. That's what I heard. Mm-hmm. Do you believe mm-hmm. that? Yep. Um, I wouldn't have found it as soon okay. as I did. Let's put it that way. Um, I believe there's a, um, a path for everybody. And I think the path was martial arts. And it, so I, I eventually think I would have found it, you know, some, you know, might've been a couple more years until I founded it, mm-hmm. but I think I wouldn't have found it without watching that movie as soon as I did. And that's kind of when I needed it the most down there. That makes sense. It does. So many of these, we'll call them origin stories on the show, come from someone seeing something that just kind of became the final piece that clicked in. And honestly, it's it's a lot of Bruce Lee movies, or mm-hmm. it's The Karate Kid, or it's Ninja Turtles, or it's a particular person. When people talk about getting into martial arts, they don't talk about it as this long process of developing into the person who's, you know, getting ready, sort of this the cliche when the student is ready, the master will appear. It always seems to be this final kick. But yet, mm-hmm. if you weren't ready, the movie wouldn't have had the impact. If I wasn't ready, then, you know, my origin story wouldn't have kicked off in that way. It would have been a much longer process. Do you think people are destined to be right for martial arts? 
Absolutely. Or is it Absolutely. okay? All right. Tell me about that. Um, now, guess I've been teaching for twenty some odd years now, and um, you know, I I've been through literally thousands of students coming through my dojo, and um, I don't know how to put it. Some are are coming in for different reasons, and they don't stay as long as they should be. Um, but I can always spot the one that I know is going to make it to black belt and above. They have something a little bit different in their eyes. Um, I think that they were destined to wear a black belt on them, and that's far in between. Um, but I can definitely spot them. I think there's people out there that that is drawn to it, and they've been drawn to it since they were a little kid. They could be watching, you know, kung fu movies on Sunday mornings, and they've been, been punching since they were three years old and don't know what they were doing. But they always had that interest in it, and they couldn't explain it. So I think people are, are destined to do martial arts. I really do. Um, cause I've been through people who says they want to do it and their heart's not in it. But then I can find that some person that shows up for every class and they train hard and they sweat and they, they put everything they have behind it. And I can tell that there's a drive in them that I can't put into them. It's already into them. I just have to help develop it. So yeah, I think people are destined for martial arts. Absolutely. Where do you think that drive comes from? Is it, you think it's a single place if we, and, and this isn't a, a rhetorical question. It's not me asking a question that I even have an opinion on. It's a question that just came to mind. You're talking about these commonalities, this drive, these people that I agree are destined to find martial arts. What's that common thread? What is it about them and their personality or their upbringing that we can look at and tie everyone together? Um, I don't know if there is a, a one common thread in somebody. Um, I haven't been able to identify that yet. I just know that I can see them in their eyes. I don't know how to explain that. Um, and I think the common thread is different for everybody. They could be picked on like I was. Um, they wanted to find that something that they could master in martial arts would be something that they really thought they could take care of and master and come a black belt in. Um, I don't really know if there is a common thread except what they want to be excelling in something. They want to um, be able to say, hey, I finished this or I made this and I've done this. I mean, I think it's just like the military. I think certain people, they're destined to be in the military and because they want to be they want to be challenged. They want to be given something higher than themselves. And I think that's the same with, with martial artists. They find out that, hey, a black belt is something that is not everybody has, and I need to work for it, and I need to challenge myself in that. So that might be the common thread is that they want to be challenged. They want to be pushed into something that is not normal. They want to be able to set a goal for themselves that a lot of people do not obtain on there. That makes sense? It absolutely does. And... And I think you're right. I think I think that that lines up. And I'm going to think about it more. Because as I said, when I asked the question, it wasn't a question that I had even thought to ask. Mm-hmm. So I appreciate your answer. Oh, my pleasure. What do you do when you're not training or teaching? You know, what's life look like for you outside of martial arts? Well, um, I like to spend a lot of time with my family. I mean, I work a uh, second job, too, so I don't get a lot of time with my family. So when I do have free time, I do like to spend time with my family. They're very important to me. Um, they kind of keep me grounded. And then I do, I, I love to draw. That's one of my favorite things to do. Is, um, I have a little drawing thing at my house, and I'll sit down, and it's kind of a meditation therapy for me. If I'm having a bark that day or I need to clear my head, I'll sit down and do some drawing and so just, I think drawing and spending time with my family is my, my biggest things I like to do with it. What do you draw? Um, rodeos are big in Durango. I live in Durango, Colorado, and we have a lot of rodeos. So I'll go and take some pictures of, um, you know, a different rodeo things, or I'll find something on in, on Facebook or whatever, and I'll sit there and I'll draw pictures of cowboys on horses or on bulls being left off. Or so I draw like a lot of different Western theme type of things with it. Okay. I, I, to me, it's kind of you know it's kind of fun um, to capture that moment when you have that that adversary of bull and cowboy. And to me, that's kind of a fun picture to draw for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Does does that culture of the Southwest ever? 
creep into martial arts, people showing up in cowboy hats. And, you know, does anybody ever want to put a belt on with chaps? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I haven't have any sh- uh, chaps here in, in, in the thing, but they do show up for a lot with, um, with cowboy hats on, but I don't think they ever put them on and with their, on the mats themselves <laughs> on there. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, if I gave them permission, they might want to on there, with, but I've never seen that. But, yeah, we do, um, you know, um, Drango is of a Western heritage town. We do have a lot of agriculture and we do have a lot of Western um, people on there. And so, yeah, every now and then we'll get somebody coming in and, you know, they have their cowboy hats on and, you know, I'm going to man up and say I have my cowboy hat that's sitting on my desk and my boots are sitting by the um, the shoe racks just like somebody else on there. So, yeah, we, we get that culture in there, but never mm. on the mat. <laughs> Is there, hmm, another question I've never even thought to ask. So, Many of the listeners know I live in Vermont. I come from New England. We have a strong tradition of agriculture here as well. And there's something that I've noticed about the training approach, the, I guess the dedication to martial arts training among those folks who come from farm families. Mm-hmm. Is there something similar, you know, when, when folks come in out of, out of agricultural lineage? Do you Absolutely. notice they're harder? I, I- yeah, I, I've noticed that more in a lot of the adults too, but I noticed that more in the kids, um, like the teenagers, um, who they have to basically do chores at work at home. Um, they have to get up and, and 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 buck the hay. They have to get up and feed the cows, and they have a little bit more of um, a drive to be able to push themselves and to practice more. They're, they're a little bit more focused on things. Um, you know, they're they're so teenagers, and I got to get on my get on them every now and then. But they do have that drive to where um, they know they have to put some hard work into it, and they're not afraid of the hard work on there. Because I think that's a lot to do with their upbringing of having to go out there at, at four o'clock in the morning and feeding the cows and and helping their dads, you know, shipping irrigation water. And so I think there is a big difference in the in the way they approach their training. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I think so too. Is competition something that you guys talk about much in your school? No, um, you know, um, I was never really raised on competition in my upbringing in California. Um, I think I did maybe two competitions growing up, and I did very well in them. I mean, I don't think I placed more than third place on them. And I enjoyed them, but when I moved up to the Durango, uh, my instructor was not really a competition person. Is this kind of more how effective is your art if you need to, you know, basically do self defense? So something that we never really um, was brought up on in this school. Hmm. But lately, some of my uh, students been wanting to do competitions, and about two years ago, I took a handful of them down to Santa Fe, and it was a just speaking um, competition, and you know, we did very well. We took home some trophies out of five people. I think we took home about three trophies, and they enjoyed it. So it's something we're looking more into doing nowadays with it. What do you see as the benefits? We have a lot of people on the show who come from a tradition of competition. They spend a lot of time competing in their earlier days, and so they have, you know, they, they see some value in it because they know what it has done for them. Most of the folks who did not have a tradition of competition rarely get into it and, you know, I I don't want to say make it a priority, but it it seems like whatever you grew up with, whether that's a tradition of competition or how you approach Mm. forms or anything, that's what your school becomes. And it almost sounds like you're saying you're letting some of your students have a little bit different yeah, we're making a slight shift in, yeah. in what, what school. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I found after I took, um, I think it was six kids down there. Um, you know, out of all the kids we have, I think I only took about six of them down there. And what I found is, um, one, it was fun for them. They really enjoyed it. They they enjoyed the competition part of it. They enjoyed the camaraderie um, of the competition, of the other competitors. Um, they really enjoyed that part of it a lot. And they formed a better friendship out of being a team and then 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 being an individual that makes sense to you so i think they got a lot of it out of being a team 
they really enjoy that part of it as going down there as one unit. And then I also, you know, the ones that came back um, with trophies, I, you know, even the ones that didn't come back with trophies, they held their heads a little bit higher. They 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 were proud of what they accomplished on there. They um, even if they didn't win a trophy, they were proud that they went into that tournament and they gave everything they had and they were recognized for it. So I think that's what I found the beneficial of it is one it builds a uh, team work better. It, it makes them um, stronger as a unit, and then it gives them a little bit more pride and confidence in themselves as being you know, competition wise. And that, that's not for everybody, but that's for mm. some of them. And that's the ones that I'm kind of giving a chance to do is I say, Hey, if you guys want to do this, there's one coming up in a couple of months. Let's go ahead and start working on it. And if you don't want to, that is fine too. We'll just sit there and we'll do what we've been doing with it. So I think that's what I decided I wanted to kind of change a little bit. We're not going to be actually looking for competitions, but if we find one that's interested in us and the kids want to do it or the adults, We'll look at it and we'll do it for it, absolutely. We spend so much time in martial arts holding up the benefits of individual progress, of personal growth. And at the same time, we watch as team sports, especially once kids hit that adolescent phase, pulling people away. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like you're seeing the benefit of both of finding opportunities that people can be individuals, succeed as individuals, but still feel like part of a group. Absolutely. And I think some of the kids that come through my school, um, be, be either homeschooled or whatever their background is, they need that, um, that belonging of becoming part of the tribe. That makes sense to you. Mm. And I think that's what competition does. Is that, I mean, cause I, out of the six that I took, over the last couple of years, their friendship has grown so much bigger and they go out with each other and they hang out with each other outside of the Christ school and they actually became a team. And I, I love seeing that on there. So I think some of the kids, they kind of crave that without them even knowing it. With it. I think we all want to be part of something. We want to be part of a group. I think we want to succeed and you know, when we talk about commonalities, one of the commonalities among children, young children that get into martial arts is, like you or I, they were in some way kind of pushed out. You know, we didn't click. Well, I, I shouldn't speak for you. I didn't click well with team sports. Oh, absolutely. So, absolutely. Either did I. Okay. So in martial arts, we find our thing where we can succeed, but the desire to be part of something else never goes away. Absolutely. And, and I think with martial arts, that's a great um, um, thing is that, you, you know, you can become, you know, it, it's one-on-one. -on -one. It's you against yourself. But it's also, you know, if you have the right environment and you have the right um, instructor, you know, you can make it that you're part of the team. Even if you don't do competitions, you're part of the experience. You're part of something special. Um, you're surrounded by people that have the same goals that you do and i think people feed off of that I, I really truly believe that so you know i think martial arts has great things for both sides of it you get your individualism you get to kind of be one-on-one -on -one against yourself but you get that other side where you have somebody pushing you saying hey you know you can make the black belt you can and you need people to do that for you so i think martial art has a great kind of yin yang type of thing to it yeah yeah when we and we i would say of the schools that i visit I, I travel around a bit. The schools mm -hmm. that seem to have the strongest programs, especially in that team dem demographic, they have some way of mimicking, if not outright creating a team dynamic, whether that's a tournament mm -hmm. team or a demonstration team or, you know, some, a leadership team. And there are, there are a lot of ways that they implement it, but it often uses the word team. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I have a demonstration team also, and, um, you know, they're, 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 they have a great time doing it. You know, it, it's something that they feel special doing it, but they have that common that common bond between the two of them. And I think a lot of kids really, truly, especially ones who are pushed towards martial arts, sometimes they feel they don't belong to a, like a basketball or baseball. They're not good at that, but they want something where they are part of the team. And I think that's Given the demonstration team, a competition team, you know, a leadership team, like you said, 
gives them that experience where, hey, you know, I may not be good at this, but I'm still part of the team because I'm good at this. You know, and they just had to find that calling with it. Are you a fan of modern martial arts movies or movies beyond Bruce Lee's? I am. Um, I don't know if they're considered martial art movies, but I love the John Wick movies. <laughs> they keep coming up on the show. We keep talking about them. <laughs> and listeners, if you have not seen John Wick and John Wick 2, and I'm going to guess you're going to throw the Raid movies in as well. Because uh-huh. everyone seems to. They, they lump those together. Check them out. Why do yeah, you I, like them? Well, one, I, I like the fact that um, Keanu Reeves actually did the training. Um, I, I don't like actors who rely on sent people to um, to do what they need to be done. I mean, because to me, when he does the training, it means that he believes in what he's doing. And you can tell, I mean, the action's better. Um, his character's better. Um, the fight sequences are so much uh, more realistic because you can tell, hey, oh, that's what he's doing. Oh, you know. So I like the way that he's training. Um, so I, I, I like that part of that he does most of the training himself to make that character a bit leading. Plus, I have I just like the action in it. <laughs> yeah, fantastic movies. Absolutely. Um, and then the other movie um, I was kind of wondering is um, I like any of the Jason set. Statham movies, I like any of him. Um, I like the way that he does. He has one called Homefront. I do believe it's called Homefront. And I was just watching that a couple weeks ago on Netflix, and I thought that was a great movie, too. That was kind of a fun movie for him to, for me to watch. I enjoyed that one. Yeah, and, you know, he almost seemed to usher in this kind of newer style of martial arts movie where, you know, he, he does not come from a background of martial arts, but mm-hmm. did the work, as you said, mm-hmm. and does a tremendous job. He's got the athleticism, he's got the dedication, and what he portrays is really solid to the point where most people don't realize he doesn't have a martial arts background. No, no, and I did not believe that until I actually was reading up on him. I thought he had a great martial arts background until I started reading up on him because he does, it's a solid performance. I mean, he everything he does is to my opinion, is fantastic. I mean, it's um, right on the money. You know, so I, he worked hard at becoming what he is, and it, it shows in his movies on there with it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And then I don't know if you heard, but the, the new Cobra Kai is coming out on um, oh, YouTube so ex- Red. So excited. Are you going to watch? Yeah, you know, absolutely. I don't do YouTube very often, but um, I just actually got up on YouTube Red just so I can watch it when it comes out. And I'm kind of excited to see how that one plays out a little bit with it. So I think that's the yeah. new modern thing I want to watch is that new Cobra Kai one on there yeah. with it. So for anybody listening that may not know, um, the original cast, well, a number of them, from the Karate mm-hmm. Kid films, including Ralph Macchio, including... Uh, Billy Zabka, William Zabka, are going to be starring in a paid YouTube exclusive show called Cobra Kai. And so YouTube Red is is the paid YouTube version. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there are a lot of martial artists that I hear talking about it. And, and the, the, the final thing they say is, I guess I have to sign up, you know, to pay for YouTube now. Because how can we yeah. let this one go? Yeah, that's it. I, I was battling back and forth because I don't like to sign up and pay for things very often. Um, but this one, I, I had to break down and, and, and sign up for it. You know, after after the episodes are over, I might have to switch my way of thinking. But right now, I had to sign up for YouTube, and um, I'm excited to see how that story kind of plays out a little bit. You know, now, how did those movies and that characterization impact you the, in the originals? Um, and... The original one. Yeah. Um, how old was I? I was kind of a teenager around that area. Um, you know, to me, it was a, the battle of good versus evil. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, you have Daniel San, who um, he's basically a good kid. He's he wants to just live his life, and then you have, you know, Johnny, who, um, you know, I think that he's actually was a good kid. He just had a bad teacher, and 
he had to kind of overcome his issues too. So I think to me, it was more of a battle of good and evil, not only for the, the characters, but within themselves, you know, Daniel had to kind of find that fighting spirit that he had. And then Johnny, I think towards the end, he kind of had to figure out, Hey, this is not what martial arts was about. And I have to change my way of thinking. So I think that's kind of where I was coming from that I had to put them. They had to, I had to find my fighting spirit like Daniel and then um, make sure I don't push that into the Johnny zone <laughs> where I'm mm. becoming a bully or that makes sense to you. Yeah. So I think that's where I, I that, that impacted me that the characters were, you know, if you looked at them more than just, you know, what they were, they were very, you know, deep characters. They were kind of finding themselves in that movie, basically. Mm. There's a great episode of the sitcom, How I Met Your Mother, where Neil Patrick Harris's character explains the karate kid but from the opposite perspective that that daniel is the villain and that johnny is actually the hero and i'm, I'm going to try and find that on on youtube and i'll link that in the show notes so if anybody's new we drop show notes at whistlekick martial arts radio.com so stuff we're talking about links to you know movies and people and and just things that have come up on the show you can check all those out over there yeah have you, have you seen what i'm talking about in that show yeah, I, I've heard that theory where, you know, Dan, you know, I could see that to a point. I mean, Daniel was, and, and, and Ralph Machaccio's character of Daniel, he was kind of arrogant at some point. He, um, I, I don't think he was kind of a total angel in that movie. I think no. he pushed the limit sometimes when, you know, so, and then I, like I mentioned on Johnny, um, you know, there's that, what is that, uh, quote on there, there's no such thing as a bad student, just a bad teacher. Mm. I think that Johnny was basically a good kid at heart because um, I, I think there's one point in the movie where he says, I have a year to make it work. I'm an ex delinquent and I have one year to make this right. I think he was really trying to make himself a better person, but he was just being held back by a bad teacher. So I think at the end of it, he was trying to find himself and, um, you know, when he handed that trophy to Daniel, I think that was a big shift in his way of thinking so yeah I, I think that there's both sides of blame daniel was a good kid but he wasn't um the angel everybody made him out to be and i think you know johnny was a bad kid but he had some good qualities in him yeah. people it. are far more nuanced and maybe that's why that movie holds up because it's not that the acting is exceptional or that the story is anything revolutionary or even that the choreography is that good but i think maybe it's that it's a really honest look yeah. that you know our villains aren't entirely bad our heroes aren't entirely good you know i mean it, uh, that is the manifestation of of the yin yang symbol absolutely absolutely and I, I i agree that you're right on that um you know the movie was, was, was a pretty decent movie it was not an award-winning movie i don't think it's gonna was gonna win any oscars but i think that if people seen it for what they wanted to see it for every person that watched that movie they took something different out of it um for whatever reason or whatever thing they took out of that movie resonated with them. And, you know, I think that's why it does hold up, what, 30-something years later on. Yeah. With it. Absolutely. It's been a while. All right. Yeah, it makes me feel old when I think back that part <laughs> away. <laughs> I just try not to do it. Yeah, me I, I just I try, try not, not. I try not to think, think about that. Absolutely. What's keeping you going? Your training, your teaching, you're clearly still passionate about martial arts. So my question oh, is why? One, um, one is passing on my knowledge. I mean, I had some great instructors um, growing up. You know, my original teacher was Jeff Neff out of um, United Karate Studio in uh, Garden Grove, California, West Coast, California. And he is one of my original teachers. And then my teacher nowadays, um, Steve Schroeder, who I had for the last 20-something years, um, I want to say, okay, I want to um, uphold what they told and showed me i want to keep that legacy going i want to keep their dream of martial arts going so one i see the impact we live in a very small town and um matter of fact i went to dinner yesterday and i ran in before my students at dinner and i <laughs> like seeing how what difference i make in their life um either by just seeing it or them telling me so i'm very passionate about improving people's life you know i always said that um I can make anybody and I can teach anybody how to fight and I can teach them how to punch and kick, but it's hard to make them into a better human being or help them find their path in life. And I enjoy that part of it a lot. Um, to me, that's what kind of keeps me going. 
And then, um, other than that, um, for personal wise, I like to keep myself moving. I like to keep myself um, going. Um, I'm getting up there in age. I just turned 50 and I know that's not old, but I want to still keep pushing myself and making myself better. I want to keep finding challenges for me and, and try to see if I can answer them challenges with it. All right. And if people want to reach out to you, you know, how can they, how can they find you? You know, tell us about, I, th- I think you've got a website and. We have a website, which is uh, com, and you can leave messages on there. We have our schedule on there, classes, and we have what we're about and kind of my history and my background. And then we do have a Facebook page. It's Dringle Kimple Karate Studio on there, um, so you can look that up. And we have a Twitter account, and we do have Instagram. Um, I don't do the Instagram as much as I should be, honestly. Um, I don't really get that part of it very often, but I do do the uh Twitter account very often, and so you can reach us on Twitter and and on Facebook. Right. And what words would you leave the listeners with before we go? Um, be yourself. Be true to who you are and why you got into martial arts. Um, over, I mean, I've been in martial arts since I was 11 years old. I'm 50 years old now. I have a lot of people trying to tell me their version of their truth of what their path is, um, what their version of their martial art journey is, and for a while, I was trying to follow their journey, not my journey. Um, what I seen in their eyes, I was trying to see in my eyes, and that's not that's not good for anybody. So what I would leave people is find your journey and stick with it. Find the reason you're passionate about it. Find the reason why you started it, um, and and stick with that reason. Don't make anybody else's dream your dream. You're going to have up and down. You're going to have. Um, you know, you're going to have places where you want to quit in your career. You're going to have places where you're going to thrive in career and just realize that that is a journey. You're always going to have things that's going to make you want to quit. Keep with it. Push yourself to that limit and, and make it your own journey and have fun doing it. I really appreciated our guest today sharing his experiences, being so open, and how he's used some of those experiences to help teach children facing the same challenges. I have no doubt there are a number of kids growing up better and healthier because of his time. Thank you, Master Smith, for your great work and your heartfelt passion for the kids growing up like us. Head on over to WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com. Check out the show notes with photos and links and video on some of the show notes pages. All the stuff that will give you more context, more insight into who our guests are. If you want to know more about Whistlekick, you can check out whistlekick.com. You can find us on social media. We are at Whistlekick, primarily on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, but we're other places as well. And of course, you can email me directly, jeremy at whistlekick.com. I want to thank you for your time. Thank you for your support. And thank you for tuning in to Martial Arts Radio. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.